Go ahead and accept that. Okay, good. And uh, let's start to take a look at this information for transaction cycles. And uh, they list out the various transaction cycles to us here. And um, there's a slightly more comprehensive listing in a table inside the book here that we're gonna look at in a couple minutes. But there is absolutely no way to pass the auditing exam without knowing how to um, audit these transaction cycles. This is 30 points, guys. There is no way that you can pass the auditing exam if you're not comfortable with how to audit these transaction cycles. And so I am <clears throat> planning to get through that information here tonight so that you can kind of look at it as one cycle compares to the others to the other. What I'm going to do as I go through this is I'm going to keep reminding you that even though we're parsing this out as transaction cycles, you're going to see that we talk about auditing the assertions inside of these cycles. So your challenge is to get used to internal controls that will uh, guard against misstatement in the assertion embedded in the cycles. And then what are the substantive procedures that would allow you to detect a misstatement uh, in those uh, assertions in those transaction cycles. But again, key thing, 30 points on the exam. There is no way to pass the um, auditing exam without knowing how to handle these transaction cycle questions. Uh, we'll start getting into um, you know, some other matters here. And uh, I'm just gonna call out one of them is litigation. How will we handle litigation, okay? And that's going to be about five points, okay? We'll also talk about initial audits in this chapter. Initial audit is like the first audit that an entity goes to. Pretty light, probably about two points. Okay, and then uh, we're going to talk about going concern. And the auditor's responsibility in that area, and that's about two points. Okay, then um, we will uh, talk about the written representation letter. That's going to be, um, well, uh, misstatements and internal control deficiencies, guys, comes next. That's about 10 points. We probably won't get to that until next time. We'll talk about written representations. That's five points. And then communication with those charged with governance is about uh, two points. Okay, so rich point area, the big one being these 30 points here on the transaction cycles. Okay, now if you come over to page three now, they start listing the various transaction cycles. And uh, even though we're sort of starting with the revenue cycle here, they list all of the cycles that you saw, most of which you saw in that table of contents. And I'm not gonna call out the points per cycle, but of those 30 points, okay, and I'll write 30 points here again. For the transaction cycles, you can see that revenue is heavy, expenditures are heavy, cash is heavy, Okay, are there any um, light ones here? Inventory is heavy. Uh, investments are fairly light. Okay, and then they say other transaction cycles. Um, and this is a little misleading because they have some pretty important ones in here and they just sort of lump them all into one for some reason, but property, plant, and equipment. Okay, that's probably medium. Um, even though just about every entity has property plan equipment that would require some audit procedures, um, it's pretty easy thing to audit so the examiners don't spend as much time with that. Payroll and personnel is heavy because they figure every entity has a payroll, has personnel. And so uh, they would want to see if you know how to audit that uh, transaction cycle. And then financing and uh, like investments are light. So the financing and the investments are fairly light, but uh, most of these are heavy with property plan equipment being medium. Um, but the reality is that that's an actually pretty easy thing to audit. And so there'll be some pretty uh, basic questions there. Okay. Now we start talking about the revenue cycle here and we don't get very far 
and they start you know reminding us about the risk related to fraud in the revenue cycle and that makes sense because when there have been fraud schemes um over the years uh, it's been around revenue i mean you don't read an article you know about fraud in the office supply account okay it tends to be around revenues okay so when you take a look notice they sit here and they say well there's concern about early recognition of revenue holding the books open past the close of the accounting period so that revenues that belong in the next period could be counted for in the previous period fictitious sales failure to record sales returns side agreements to uh, get the customers to accept goods and services they otherwise do not need you know you tell them hey you can return this for two years up to two years you can still return this well then it's not actually a sale right channel stuffing um basically trying to get them to buy stuff now in the near term um all of these relay guys to overstatements okay we're worried about overstatement of revenue so if we're worried about overstatement of revenue what assertion are we concerned about autumn i think you're that telling us but you're muted no i said can you repeat that yeah um if we're talking about overstatement of revenue what assertion is we're worried about being misstated where is everybody? I'm thinking about it. <laughs> no, no, I don't mean it that way that they don't answer the question. I just want to just kind of looked at the my panel here and I've got nine people in the class and I'm two of them. Uh, beats me. Okay. Well, I see I'm going to be sending out some nasty emails tonight. This class is all about being here, and I know I'm preaching to my small choir tonight, but this isn't, you know, I'm not putting a whole lot of uh, requirements on folks here, but that you be here and that you take in this information to help you pass the exam, and then people are going to blow that um, off. Would that assertion be, if it's overstatement, would it be a, a, a existence and occurrence? Yes, very good. Very good. Okay, we're talking about the existence assertion, right? If they're putting down re existence, if we're putting down revenue that did not occur, we're overstating the revenue. That means that that revenue didn't exist, it didn't occur. So that means that it's going to be important that we understand internal controls that will prevent or detect misstatement and the existence assertion. And we're going to look for audit procedures that will help us to detect such misstatement, right? Okay. Okay, good. Why don't you go ahead, guys, and flashcard these, uh, you know, fraud risk schemes for uh, revenue recognition, just because, you know, everybody worries about that these days. And so I want you to have some sense as to what some of these are. And then just keep in mind that we're going to look for controls that will prevent overstatement in the sales. We're worried about the existence occurrence assertion primarily. Okay. So we start to look at the sales and they start talking about different departments and different responsibilities in the sales revenue uh, cycle. And um, when you look at these, you're really looking at the separation of the authorization of the transaction which we're going to abbreviate a versus the record keeping which we'll have as r versus the what versus the custody of the item and so we have the what we have arc here okay and i probably wrote it in a bad place because uh, i'm gonna i don't want it to write it next to the preparation sales order part because that is one of these okay so you think about which of these functions are being performed by these departments that helps you to answer the question i'm much more important to me that you know what duty these departments have than the details under what what they do because it just helps you remember okay preparation of the sales order is an authorization step so when the question says which of the following would be performed by the um you know prepper uh by the um by the sales order department, 
Well, it would be the clear authorization step would be the correct answer that you would choose there. Okay, so they tell us that the sales function begins with the receipt of a customer purchase order sale um, by the sales department. Okay, so this is what authorization, record keeping, or do you think this is um, custody? That's a question. Record keeping? Mm -hmm. Authorizing. Well, this is an authorization step because they're saying, hey, there's a valid customer here and we need to fill an order for this customer. Okay, so that's authorization. Okay, and we're basically going to prepare a sales order and we're going to send that to the credit department for credit approval so it's an authorization that we're saying hey we're beginning this process we have a legitimate customer here okay and then we go to a different department for credit approval now why do we go for to a different department for credit uh, approval who determines whether or not the customer received the goods on credit why don't we just let the sales department do that well, that would be the segregation of duties, I would think. Well, all of the segregation of duties, because it's different departments doing different things. This is a different authorization, though, isn't it? Yes. One is saying that we have the customer. The other one is saying that they have good credit. But why do we have to separate these two? Because one has to do with whether or not the customer exists, and the other one has to do with an assessment of their ability to pay. Right, but why do we want to separate those? Because there's an incentive for the sales order people, the, the sales people who might be commission incented, for example, right. to be more generous than they should be on the credit side. I don't care if they can pay as long as I get my commission, right? Exactly. So we have a credit department's job who's going to you know, look up their credit rating and all that kind of stuff, right? Okay. Right. Okay, good. That's why when you go, I don't know if you've ever gone to the store and they ask, would you like to open an instant account today? We'll save you $100. And you say, okay, sure. You know, and then you got to sit there and wait. And then all of a sudden, the you know, the cash register starts running the, this receipt through because it went through, right? Because someone else checked your credit. Okay, good. Now, um, let me ask you this. Why does the auditor care that there be separation? What do we care about credit? Why do we care about credit approval? To see if they have a good internal control. Okay, why do we care about this internal control? This is an internal control. Why do we care about it? Fraud. Mm -hmm. Risk. Huh? Fraud risk. Oh, I don't see this being a real fraud issue. I think it might be. Yeah. In valuation simply because you want to be getting customers that will pay you such that your allowance for doubtful accounts can be smaller. Okay, you're right there. Okay. Um, first of all, you said valuation, which is an assertion. Right? Mm -hmm. Valuation is assertion. So the auditor looks for controls, like Serena said, that will do what? It'll prevent or detect a misstatement in an assertion. In this case, is valuation. And you're right. If my client has a good uh, credit program, right, then they're going to have a pretty consistent collectability of their um, receivables, which means that the allowance account is going to be a relatively small number because they're not having to have huge write offs and put a huge amount into the allowance which means that I don't use up as much materiality issue on the um, allowance account, which means that I can turn my audit resources to more risky areas. And so maybe I'll just do an analytical procedure. I'm gonna probably look to see that they have this credit program as part of my internal control testing, but then I'm going to probably just do an analytic procedure as a substantive test do some comparisons, some ration, and you know, how do they compare to industry or something? And I'm done and I haven't expended a lot of audit resources on this. Okay, good. Okay, this is the way you need to keep thinking about all this stuff in terms of the assertions. Okay, 
Then we have a separate shipping department that will actually ship the goods. And there's this uh, serially numbered bill of lading. Guys, don't trip on the term bill of lading. It is simply a packing slip. Okay. <laughs> when you order something over the internet and they send you the thing, they give you that little packing slip that details what's in there. That's all a bill of lading is. Okay. And uh, is this authorization, record keeping, or custody? Custody. This is custody, right? Because they actually have the item in the shipping department. And then we actually do the billing. And billing is what? Authorization, record keeping, custody, do you think? Record keeping. Good. That's record keeping. And the billing department prepares a serially numbered sales invoice, shipping documents, sales orders, and invoices are compared to assure that all shipments were based on a valid customer order and are properly billed. And then, of course, then we are going to have the uh, accounting department, which is a record keeping department, enter the information into the sales journal. Good. Okay, so we've got the sales there. Now we've got accounts receivable because, of course, we want to make a sale on credit. We want to collect on that, right? So a receivable is recorded in the accounts receivable control account in the general ledger and in the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. Periodically, an independent person should reconcile these two records. When they say an independent person, you can flashcard that they are not talking about the auditor okay even though in the real world in our world we're the only true independent person in the room they're talking about somebody independent of this process of recording into the subsidiary ledger and recording into the um a general ledger they're probably talking about internal audit department i have a question about something one of the places mm -hmm. i tend to get lost in some of these running through the innards of a company is I don't know where I am in the process. Is an accounts is a control account like an accounts receivable control account something that is subordinate to the subsidiary account? I'm, I'm confused about the distinction. No, the, 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 subsidi the subsidiary account would be more. What word did you use? Subservient to the. Um, yeah, because I was trying to, to figure out. Yeah, does it go into the accounts receivable control account, then a subsidiary ledger, and then the general ledger? Or, you know, I'm I'm, I'm getting lost in my here's in my, my subsidiary here. ledger. Okay, and in there I have Adams, and Adams owes the company two thousand. Owes my client two thousand, whatever. And then I have Burns, three thousand, all the way down to Zito. I can sit here and write 50 names, right? And Zito has, you know, a thousand, okay? Mm -hmm. Then I add all that up. And when I add all those people up, let's just say it was these three, just to make this a, you know, easier to understand example. That means that there's $6,000 mm -hmm. in the GL, in the general ledger, it'll show along with other accounts, accounts receivable should have $6,000 showing in there so you have a general ledger that rolls up the what's in the subsidiary okay so then where is the accounts receivable control account what is oh, that yeah sorry this is that's what they mean accounts receivable control. It, it says accounts receivable control account. i don't care what it says oh okay i'm telling you the accounts receivable control okay, so the, is, the, is the general ledger is okay. the general ledger got yeah. it sorry right. I, yeah. I thought it was like a separate account i was getting confused no accounts receivable control account in the general ledger okay so it says it yeah i didn't mean to get smart no, I just don't, uh, don't I've forget, never guys. been inside a company, so I don't know. I don't know what stuff's called. Sorry. <laughs> Every now and then, my Hayward Puerto Ricans come out. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I'll try to keep them at bay. Okay. All right. Yeah. So th that's a fine question, Kathy. That's accounts receivable control account is is in in, in the general ledger. That's what they mean. Okay. Got yeah. it. Okay. Okay. Good. And somebody should reconcile those. Uh, they say periodically.
depending on the nature of the entity, this could be done daily. I mean, if you're a bank, nobody goes home until all the records reconcile. So, you know, it really, um, you know, it really kind of depends on the nature of the entity is how frequently that's done. Okay. Now, when the um, cash is collected, from the customer, of course, we will debit the cash and credit the receivable. And we do that in the subsidiary ledger, but then that needs to roll up to the control account as well, right? So they should always match, um, you know, cause you gotta keep track by customer what they owe you. Okay, okay, good. I mean, that's why they invented accounting. I mean, at one time, if so, you owed somebody money and you didn't pay them back, um, they, you know, put you into a prison somewhere or they put you on a ship where you had to row your way out of it. So, um, you know, accounting has been around for a long time to keep, you know, track of who owes who what. Okay. Okay, good. Um, now we come down and we look at uh, uncollectible receivables and an aging schedule. An aging schedule is prepared and sent to the credit department for use in carrying out its collection program. Okay, now that aging schedule is prepared and put here by client. Because sometimes I think that um, candidates get confused and they think that the um, that this accountant prepares the aging schedule, the client prepares the aging schedule. And they're gonna say, these receivables are current, these are 30 days past due, 60 days, and so on. And they uh, age those receivables um, that way. The auditor though, would inspect, auditor inspects the aging schedule. Okay, so you would ask the client for the aging schedule and you start to take a look at that and eventually you're going to recalculate what they're putting into the allowance based on the aging schedule. So the auditor inspects the client's preparation of the uh, aging schedule. So you can go ahead and flashcard that just so that you're clear that the auditor inspects the client's aging uh, preparation of the aging schedule. Now they tell us at some point, of course, uncollectible receivables are going to be written off and they should be written off by the treasurer. Flashcard that the treasurer writes off any uncollectible receivables. Okay. Question. And they tell us here without proper controls, you know, a receivable could be written off and then the client's customer pays and that cash is stolen. So you have to have that authorized at a high level to write off by the treasurer, okay? Sales returns, okay? And for sales returns, you can use a serially numbered receiving report, maybe used as a sale return slip. And they tell us that credit memos should not be prepared by individuals collect or receive cash payments. Okay, that's a problem with segregation and duty. Now, the reason they call it a credit memo is what happens. If I have an account receivable that I'm writing uh, that uh, um, a person say wants to return the goods, I'm gonna credit the account receivable and I'm gonna debit sales returns. So they're calling it a credit memo because what? There's the credit. We're crediting the person's account saying that they don't owe us anymore. So that's why they call it a credit memo. And think about it. If someone can make that entry into the system that there was a return of the sale and then later on the client's customer uh, pays, that person could steal the money, right? So you can't have them collecting the cash and having the ability to issue a credit memo that will result in that journal entry. Um, what is the other journal entry should, that should happen at the time of the sales return? Wouldn't the thing go back into inventory? Yeah, good. We would also have to debit inventory Someone ate her Wheaties today. Somebody passed the somebody passed the farms in. 
we would also have to debit inventory and we would have to what credit the cost of goods sold right let me tell you something about this thing of studying for the cpa exam you are growing your brain you are stretching your brain by doing this and that is a keeper for life you never lose that elasticity that muscle tissue whatever you want to call it that you have built up in your brain by doing this so you know someone sitting on the side saying well i'm going to take this class because you know i'm heard it's an easy a and lord's going to give out the a's and you know you don't really have to do anything and, and, and all that kind of stuff you're missing a golden opportunity not only to pass the exam but to have a game changer in your ability to process information okay all right good very good so let me ask you this then if that's the case if you were to count the inventory okay and the records showed that there was more inventory than the physical count what would that tell you that's an indication that we potentially have this problem right because the inventory is coming back i mean they were saying that the inventory came back but it didn't okay or if you have the problem that what that the uh physical count is more than the inventory then maybe they're just failing to book returns because remember we said that's a potential fraud problem as well right mm -hmm. okay so you want to think about those things okay okay good now you come over and um you take a look at uh, cash receipts okay and when we have the cash receipts now that come in incoming mail must be opened by a person who does not have access to the account receivable ledger you think they open the mail here's the cash they seal the cash they book the receivables uh, has, as having been received even though um, they, they stole the cash right these receipts should be listed in detail and three copies um listed now when they say um that they should be uh, listed in detail in three copies distributed to the following personnel. This listing is called a remittance. It's called a remittance advice. We call this an, a remittance advice, okay? Now the cashier, um takes the actual receipts they probably open those sometimes you'll have a separate mail room it really depends on the size of the entity i mean if it's an entity that's receiving a lot of mail then you probably have a separate mail room that will sort out those that contain payments and whatnot um but if you look you have the cashier receives the actual uh receipts and prepares a bank deposit ticket and then the accounting department enters receipts into the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger and then the accounting department will take the total take the total of those receipts take the total receipts and enter that into the gl that's why those numbers should match all the time so in the accounts receivable department they're doing the individual entry to each person's account in the GL, they're taking that total and they're entering that. And both of them, right? There's three of these. Um, um, there's three of these uh, remittance advices in the listing, the detail of what was uh, collected. Um, there's the copy that goes to the accounting department. That's going to what? Uh, that's going to sit there and have the total, and they'll enter the total. The subsidiary records will be updated uh, person by person for each re receipt that's listed on there. And then the cashier has the deposit ticket. Then they'll go ahead and the accounts receivable department will get that deposit ticket and the accounts receivable department will match the details from the bank deposit ticket with the detail from the remittance advice. So everything that was supposedly deposited should be on the remittance advice. And the accounts receivable department is looking at that detail and comparing it to the deposit ticket so that they know that they made the correct entry okay 
Now, they also tell us that cash collections should be restrictively endorsed upon receipts. And they say devices such as lockbox. And when they say device, you picture what? A box with a lock on it, which if you're thinking about, uh, you know, Apple, that would be ridiculous that that's where all the receipts would go. Okay. So when they talk about lockbox, they are not really talking about a device. They're talking about a service offered by big banks. And in that situation, the cash receipt is sent directly to the client's bank and the bank updates the cash records at the bank. And then they send a notice. And then this process can take place with the subsidiary ledgers and the general ledger. Okay. Okay, good. Also a lot cheaper than staff. Yeah, you know, um, even the federal government uses a lockbox. Um, I was on an assignment where they had us looking at the security at the lockboxes for, um, you know, uh, checks that were sent to the um, SIG for tax payments. Uh, when you owe money to the federal government, if you look, depending on where you live, if you look, that when you owe, that is not sent to Fresno. That is sent to San Francisco. You send it to a San Francisco address. What it does is it gets sent to San Francisco because they have the bigger post offices. And then all those checks get on a truck and they come to Hayward. They cross the San Mateo Bridge, they come to Hayward and there's a Hayward processing facility where um, it's a giant warehouse. And if you go in there in March, nothing's happening. By April, this place is just paper everywhere, just being processed. Um, and what was happening, the federal government expects the banks to keep up with a certain quota. And some banks were having trouble keeping up with that quota. And so they just started shredding the returns so that when the IRS would come and inspect, it would look like they were you know, keeping up with things. Well, you know, Congress has no sense of humor about checks that are headed to the U.S. Treasury that are getting shredded. <laughs> so um, they asked GAO to go and look. And because Hayward came up as a place that had a processing center, guess who they got on the phone said, guess where you're going? <laughs> I guess they wanted me to. I was more security than anything in case somebody needed to speak Hayward. Um, but what was interesting about that assignment we didn't find any problems there at that facility, except the fact that they were keeping their main and their backup uh, on the same power grid. And I told them, you guys, you can't do that. You got to move that. You have to put your backup on a different power grid because one event will take out, um, you know, take out the main and the backup, an earthquake, because they had them both in the Bay Area. And so they changed that before the assignment was over. They, they said, hey, we moved that to Texas. We moved it back up to Texas. What was funny is not too long ago, I was having a uh, beer with a friend in, um, in uh, Pleasanton. And I started talking about the lockbox somehow. And the guy says, oh, I used to run the lockbox in Hayward. Oh, I know what it was. I told him that I lived in Hayward. And he says, oh, I used to run the, a lockbox did it in Hayward. And I looked at the guy who was a little older, but you're the guy, I remember you, you know, we were sat there cracking up that we had run into each other all those years later. But anyway, okay, so let's just take a look. So lockboxes are commonly used and like you say, they're an efficient way to, uh, you know, it's a good internal control and it's often more efficient than having staff. Now, they give us these flow charts, and I think on one of the tapes, Garrity or somebody says, memorize every flow chart. Who's going to do that? I mean, come on. All right. So what I want you to do, though, is I want you to flashcard this top part of the flow chart. I probably made it hard to see because this top part is sitting here and telling you what, who has, what, what kind of departments these are. Sales department is authorization, department authorization, credit is authorization. The treasurer's authorization for write-offs, and you can probably go ahead and just include the words write-off on that flashcard. The shipping department has custody, billing and accounting are record keeping. That's the most important takeaway from that uh, flow chart. Okay, okay, good. Now you come over, 
and you take a look at the uh, cash collection flow chart, and let's just go ahead and again flash card the functions of the department, whether they are a custody department, which is the mail room, the cashier, or are they a record keeping uh, department? They don't have authorization here. There probably would be authorization over cash collections because what happens if somebody accidentally sends me cash? What should I be doing? It will control. If I somebody mean, accidentally some, sends somebody me else cash, checking it. If somebody accidentally sends me cash, what should I do with it? Return it. I should send it back. If they someone pays me something that's not not required, I should send that money back to them, right? So there should be an authorization that when a payment comes in, it is paying a legitimate receivable of the entity or they haven't overpaid. And if they have, that should be returned. And there should be an authorization step that says, no, this is not a correct payment. So even though they didn't put that here, uh, there probably would be an authorization step over cash collection. Okay, okay, good. Um, now here, they start calling out internal controls that are, um, you know, um, relevant to the um, assertions that we're talking about. But the problem is the accounts that we're talking about. The problem is that they kind of buried the assertions in here. So it is worthwhile, for example, when we're talking about the credit department, to probably start with the assertion, find the assertion that they're talking about, and then start to look at the control procedure and visualize, and I'm not gonna go through these, every single one of these with you, but visualize to yourself how that control helps with that assertion. So I think they kind of should have put the assertion maybe you know that you're interested in, maybe you know over here, and then, um, you know, you can, and here they did, okay, perform a credit check authorization. Oh, well, that's an authorization step. That's not an assertion. So they are telling us that it's authorization, but this table, this table is a little, a little, conf, you know, uh, what's the word? Scattered here in the way they're doing things. But where you can find the assertion, okay? find the assertion first and then think through how the control helps you with that assertion. Okay. Okay, good. Now we're going to start to look here at substantive procedures. Okay. But before we look at the substantive procedures for the um, revenue cycle, um, let's just do a little review of a you know an, the accounting process so what happens we have our financial statements and our financial statement our balance sheet etc right say our balance sheet we have what we have sales on there and then we've got what we've got our sales journal and our sales journal is going to feed into the sales that are reported on the income statement right in this example okay our financial statement so we've got journals that support now you keep reading this step over and over in the book. They say, reconcile the journals to the financial statements as though that's some sort of, you know, brilliant audit procedure. Meanwhile, if these don't reconcile, if my journals aren't reconciling what they're putting in the financial statements, I'm telling the client, well, bye. I've got nothing here to audit. Good luck, okay, <laughs> to figure this out unless you want me to do a compilation here, okay? So what happens? You have the... A sales journal, and in the sales journal, there are invoices that are listed. Okay, so there's invoice one for a hundred thousand. There's invoice two, you know, and it would give information as to the name of the customer and stuff. I'm trying to just put INV, and it's getting worse and worse as I go here. 
invoice number two, right? And that one's going to have say 50,000. And then I've got invoice uh, 17. And that one's for, you know, I don't care, 10 million, doesn't matter. Okay, all right, good. Now, what happens? What the auditor decides to do is go over and look at some supporting docs. And let's say the supporting docs are um, shipping documents. And you've got shipping document number one, and you got shipping document number two, and you got shipping document number three. And then you've got um, these invoices. Invoice one, invoice two, invoice three. These are the actual documents. Okay. And so the auditor goes and they start here. They pick this invoice number one and they go and they find the actual invoice. And then they find the associated shipping document. What assertion did I just audit? I had a invoice listed in the sales journal. I want to audit that. So I went and I found the invoice. And then I found the shipping document that showed that they actually shipped those goods. Complete. Huh? Complete. Completeness. Completeness? Mm -hmm. So you're saying that by doing this, I would find something that wasn't recorded? Completeness means that something that should have been recorded was not, right? Right. So how would completeness allow me, how would this allow me to find something that wasn't recorded if I pick something that was recorded? Completeness means something wasn't recorded here, right? Right. So how would so starting with something that is recorded in the journal and then trying to find support for it be completeness? Mm. It's, I, I, you know, I can't illustrate to you the idea that something's not there. Exist, uh, existence? Good. This is existence because I'm looking at something that is recorded. Good. Something that is recorded, and I'm looking for something that proves that it actually happened. Okay. So let's do another one. We go and we look at invoice number two. And there it is. We find the invoice, we find the shipping documents. So far, so good, right? Then we go and we pick this invoice 17 and we try to find the invoice. We can't find it. That's us running around trying to find it. It's not there. So we come back and we say, hey, management, we picked this $10 million invoice that was recorded in the sales journal. And when we looked for the supporting documents, we couldn't find it. What happened? And they say, oh, that's Bob. Bob used to make that mistake all the time. We let him go. Oh, okay. Now my what? Now my professional skepticism, spidey <laughs> sense is starting to tingle a little bit because I'm like, huh? How could that happen? Okay, that's quite a big number there, right? Okay. Good. Now what happens? Now for the completeness assertion, um, Abby, I'm going to do what? I'm going to start with the supporting doc. 
and I go ahead and I find the invoice. I pick the invoice. I start with the invoice. Now I'm starting down here. I start with the invoice. I find the shipping document and I come up. Should be about there, shouldn't it? Where is it? Oh, gee, yeah, you're right. You know, that was Bob used to make that mistake too. Now, my spidey senses maybe aren't as uh, tingling as much. I'm not, but maybe they figure they have enough sales already for 2021, 2022, whatever. And they are trying to hold off that sale that they didn't book so they can slip it into the current year so they get a nice head start in the next year. Okay. Okay, so the main assertion that they talk about for the um, sales is existence. Okay, now what I don't like here is they say um, the risk is low, that there'll be an understatement, which is the completeness assertion. And I'm like, well, I don't know that the risk is low because it depends on the inherent risk and the control risk. I mean, what risk are they talking about? You know, so to me, when they're talking about risk here, they're talking about business risk. I mean, this is CPA business risk. Let's just put that the CPA's business risk. By that, what I'm meaning by that, when they're saying the risk, the CPA's business risk, CPA is worried about overstated revenue because if revenue is overstated, income will be overstated. If income is overstated, then the equity of the entity is going to be overstated. If the equity of the entity is going to be overstated, then the stock is going to be overvalued. Someone's going to pay too much for that stock and they're going to have damages. Now the CPA has a problem, right? Okay. So it's more of a business risk consideration than an audit risk or inherent risk or control risk or a detection risk issue. So they should have been more specific as to what risk they're talking about. But yes, it is true that the CPA is going to be more concerned with the existence assertion over revenue than they are with the completeness assertion because of the business risk. Okay. Now we take a look at now the transactions, auditing the transactions. And here we go. Here come the assertions, right? Okay, so when you go through and you think about these audit procedures, and I'm going to ask you to highlight some of them, okay, then we're going to be worried about the assertions. Okay, so the auditor should take a sample of sales transactions from the sales journal back to the sales invoice customer order. I didn't mention customer order in my little example and shipping documents. That is what the classic existence testing for my accounts receivable. So go ahead and flashcard that one. For the completeness assertion, what do we do? We go the other way, okay? So we would take a sample of shipping documents to the corresponding sales invoice and to the sales journal and accounts receivable subsidiary ledger to make sure it's recorded there, of course, as well. Flashcard that, okay? Now, cutoff is something that is making sure that the um, amounts are reported in the correct period, okay? So they tell us that the auditor should compare a sample of sales invoices from shortly before and after year end. Okay, now let's take a look from shortly before your end. We're looking at sales invoices from before and after, but let's first talk about the before. What do you think we're looking for? They made a sale before, shortly before your end, and we see that there was actually an invoice and a shipping document for that. So what are we looking for? Here when we're looking before different assertion, right? You're saying, well, John, you just told us that we're looking at the shipping document and the invoice for, um, you know, the existence completeness assertions. Now we're looking at the invoice again for cutoff. Yes. But what are we looking for now? See if they recognized revenue in the correct period, because if the shipping term, for example, was FOB destination, the fact that it was shipped doesn't mean that they should be recognizing the sale yet. Good. Look for shipping terms. 
right? If it was free on board shipping point, yeah, legitimate sale made before the year end. If it's free on board destination, then you got to look to see when it was received by the client's customer, right? In order to be yep. a valid sale. Good. Very good. Okay. What about the after year end? The after year end, it's like, well, wait a minute. If a sale was made after year end, then why am I bothering myself with those? Because those shouldn't be recorded, right? As a sale. Okay. Well, if it was made after year end, now you're going to check sequence of my flashcard designation is in the way here. So I can just move it. Check sequence of shipping documents. And I don't mean by sequence, I'm not talking about, you know, my shirt here. Okay, check sequence of shipping documents. Okay, and so what we're talking about here is if the last shipping document in 2021 was 300, what should be the first shipping document used in 2022? Not a trick question. 300. 301. Well, we already used 300, so now we're going to have 301. Uh, 301. Right? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, if they come in, you'd say they, they start with 305 in 2022. You're like, hey, where's 301, 302, 301? Oh, 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 those fell behind the filing cabinet. You're right. You know, and maybe what they were trying to do is, you know, hold those out you know and not include them they were 2022 sales they didn't include them and then when your back is turned they're going to slip them in at the last second as sales for uh 2021 okay okay good um come over and let's take a look at auditing accounts receivable okay and uh for the existence, we're going to confirm, okay? And we will look at that. We've already talked about confirmation um, and it's a little bit uh, annoying because we've already talked about confirmation. I think they shouldn't have bothered us to talk about confirmation before. And now we're gonna have to talk about it again as it relates specifically to accounts receivable, but that's okay. Okay, the auditor should examine the results of confirmation and um, test the adequacy of the, okay, well, they shouldn't say that. Come on, Becker, get it together. That, that, that's, that's a problem. They should not say that because confirmations do not give you evidence about the valuation assertion, okay? Confirmation just is an acknowledgement of the existence assertion that there's somebody out there that owes the client money so i don't know why they said that that pisses me off okay what they need to have said is look at the allowance okay we're looking at the allowance for doubtful accounts and what we're going to do is recalculate okay anytime you have an accounting estimate okay i'm going to say this again and again anytime you have an accounting estimate the procedure is recalculate So you're just going to basically sit there and see if you agree with the way they set up the amount in the allowance based on what you see on the aging schedule and whatnot, but ultimately the auditor will do a recalculation. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come down and um, for rights and obligations, uh, we should be really looking for liens on receivables. For example, has the company um, gone ahead and factored those receivables. Okay, so review bank confirmation and debt agreements for any kind of lien on the receivable. Maybe they borrowed money against their asset receivable and they've held those up as collateral or something. Okay, okay good. Now we get into this uh, discussion, annoying discussion of confirmation. 
And the reason it's annoying is because we've already talked about this, okay? But they tell us that the auditor should review the accounts receivable schedule for accuracy and collectability. Confirmation accounts receivable is a required generally accepted uh, auditing procedure, okay? Unless, and obviously if the receivable is immaterial, we don't even have to audit it. Confirmation would be ineffective, inherent control and risk are very low in evidence provided by other procedures. And the classic other procedure is subsequent collection. So if you've got a low risk of material misstatement and um, you can do a good subsequent collection procedure, okay then maybe you don't have to send out the confirmation. So by subsequent collection procedure, I'll look in 2022 and see if the receivables that they were asserting were existing were actually collected on. Well, that's pretty good evidence of the existence of the future economic benefit, the existence assertion. Um, but uh, you, know, you really should be sending these confirmations okay, in most cases. Now, when we look, there's positive confirmation and there's negative confirmation. Again, we talked about this pretty much, okay? But for um, positive confirmation, the auditor confirms to their client's customer stating the amount of the receivable owed by the customer at the fiscal year end. The customers are requested to return the statement directly to the auditor indicating whether they agree. And so it'll say, do you owe? $25,000, you put in the amount, and then there's a yes and a no, and you're hoping that they uh, select the no, okay? Now, um, take a look and they tell us that no positive confirmation may also be blank, which means the recipient is requested to fill in the balance. So now it's going to say what? It's going to say, how much do you owe? Okay, so what happens? You give your clients, how much do you owe? That's how we say it in Philly, okay? How much do you use, how much do you use, oh, okay? And so what happens? How much do you do, how much do you owe, okay? And you leave it blank. That's blank positive, and then they have to what? Fill it in and send it back to you. So you're essentially giving your client's customer a homework assignment, aren't you? Do you like homework? Neither does anybody else, okay? And so what you should be aware is that the blank form gives better assurance. And so we would use it if we have a high risk material misstatement, but also a lower response rate. And so you're going to have to hound them to sit there and do that homework to see what they owe at a certain date, whatever, right? Okay. Um, again, why did they say to look at the allowance, um, to look at the confirmations for the valuation assertion? And then they turn around here and they tell you that it doesn't provide evidence for valuation. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not sure why they put that up there and then argued with themselves down here, but okay. Okay, now you come with flashcard back because that's a common mistake and an exam trick. That's why I got so mad that they did that. Now you could also have negative confirmation. With negative confirmation, you do not expect the client's customer to respond to you unless they disagree with whatever the account balance is. Okay, now um, you do not you would use this when the combined assessed level of inherent risk and control risk is low. And I don't know why they don't call that what it is, which is what they're telling you RMM is low, right? If RMM is low, then what can be up? And detection risk. Detection risk can be up, meaning that what my substantive testing down is down in other words what i am using a less effective procedure that's nature isn't it mm -hmm. okay it's okay if you have that 
there are small account balances, a large number of small account balances. For example, you're not gonna send out a, a, a statistically valid sample of positive confirmation when you're auditing PG&E. Hello, I mean, you'll be there the rest of your life trying to you know, deal with all those you know, positive confirmations. And there's no reason to expect that the recipient of the request will ignore them. Hardy, har, har. Okay. But, uh, you know, those are things worth flashcarding as to when negative confirmation would be um, okay. And of course, we've talked about how it's less effective. Okay. All right. Good. Come over. And uh, they give us this annoying timing uh, difference. Um, oh, um, this annoying timing difference thing, okay? Um, and they say timing difference occurs when there's a delay in the recording receivable by the client or their customer. For example, an entity may re correctly record the receivable on December 31st when the goods are shipped to the customer, but the customer now record the payable until the goods are received on January 5th. This is not a misstatement by the seller, I guess. First of all, it depends on the shipping terms. Because if it's free on board destination, then it is a mistake. Okay. And if it was free on board shipping point, it's not a misstatement by the client, by the seller, but it is a misstatement by the purchaser because they should have recorded that as a liability at December 31st, right? Because those things were shipped and they had already taken ownership, even though they hadn't received them yet. So it's a misstatement by somebody. I don't know who in this example the way they wrote this okay okay good come over and uh, if you have confirmation non-responses you will become a hound and you will keep going after them until they are to respond and the confirmation responses are not received you would have to perform alternative procedures um, for example, again, looking at subsequent collections on those receivables is the classic alternative procedure. But you can't just say, oh, well, they didn't respond, so I'm just going to let it go. I don't want to bother anybody. You're going to have to follow up on those and find out what, what, what's going on with them. I have a question about one of the earlier points when you said this is not a misstatement. So I guess my follow-on question would be is... If the they said it, I didn't. It's a misstatement by somebody. Right. But uh, uh, my question would be, so if you're auditing completeness of liabilities and payables on the buyer's books, would you then look at the shipping documents from right around the beginning of the period? Yeah. To determine oh, yeah. When the, what the shipping things were and whether or not those got on to the you do the same cutoff is still is is a relevant assertion related to accounts payable and so i would do that i would look at the um items now instead of shipped received right that's what I, 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 year right, and, yeah. and i would be looking at the shipping terms to see what those shipping terms were and if it was a scenario like what they gave us here in this example um and it was free on board uh, shipping point, then the client that would be the buyer in that case has understated their account payable. Mm -hmm. Okay. They messed up the uh, the um, cutoff assertion. Right. Okay. Right. All right. Good. Okay. Now you come over, and that's why. I, that's why I got annoyed that they sit there and they say it's not a misstatement. Well, somebody misstated something. So that's not how it's supposed to work. They should both record receivable and a liability, you know, on each side. Okay. Okay, good. Come over and, um, you know, unless it went across, you know, the international time zone and miles, you know, date timeline or something. We're not going to get into that here. You know, um, but you take a look and the notes of the financial statements are where we're talking about when we're talking about, um, you know, um, presentation and disclosure. We're talking about the footnotes. And as we know, we have to disclose information about related parties, pledges of accounts receivable, et cetera. We're talking about the footnotes. Here. OK, good. 
Let's take a look and I find this, maybe I'm just in a bad mood today because I keep getting annoyed here. Revenue cycle, heavy cycle, 30 points. Let's give you one question to practice with. Thanks a lot. Okay, you'll see a lot more um, in your homework, but uh, let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this one. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this one. Looks like most folks have had a chance to uh, respond. And um, yeah, uh, just about everybody got this right, or everybody that responded got it right. Um, the answer here is D. If you're using blank positive instead of filled in positive, whatever they're calling that, um, then um, you know, you're gonna have lower response rates because you're making people do homework. People don't like homework. Okay, okay, good. Let's go ahead and, so the answer is D. Let's go ahead and take a look at our next cycle. Okay. And we're going to get into the expenditure cycle now. Okay, so we've got money coming in in our revenue cycle. Now in our expenditure cycle, of course, we're going to have amounts coming out. We're going to start with the internal controls. And again, we're going to talk about the segregation of duties. So we're going to talk about the uh, segre segre segregation of authorization, record keeping and custody. So the purchase, function is going to be what that's a authorization step and that's when the department in need of the asset or service sends a properly approved serially numbered acquisition request uh, to the purchasing department and we say that the actual department that is requisitioning that is asking for these goods should not have the ability to actually place the order. And they tell us this is a weakness in internal control. And what they're trying to do here is avoid kickbacks, okay? Because what happens is, and the, the way it's gone is, you know, I'm the head of the IT department and I make friends with a computer vendor. And then all of a sudden the computer vendor's taking me to football games and doing all these different things. And then they say, hey, look, we're gonna charge a little more this next uh, time around. You don't mind, do you? And now I've compromised myself, right? So what we do is we go ahead and we have a separate purchasing department, which is an authorization step. And it's their whole job to get the best price. That's how they're evaluated. 
Now I'm not going to play that game because I know that if I'm not getting a decent price for my product, I mean, for my orders that I'm ordering for goods and services for the company, I'm probably going to be finding a job pretty soon, right? Okay. So for internal control purposes, and I do want you to flashcard this, it is best that we prepare these four invoices, okay? And one will go back to the requisitioning department. Another will go to our receiving department so they know that this stuff is going to be coming in. Another will go to the accounting department because they are going to need to know that they're going to have to make uh, payable. And the other one, of course, has to go to the vendor so they know to send us the stuff, okay? Now, when we have receipts of the goods and services, that will happen in the, um, um, that will be a, uh, the receiving department. That's a custody step. And note that it is preferable that the copy of the receiving uh, of the purchase, or I should say that went to the um, receiving department, not give the amount. And they say, therefore, the uh, receiving department is uh, forced to count the uh, items and it sounds like we're trying to get a good count and that's the reason when we say forced to count meaning if you put 35 laptops on there and the vendor sends 40 laptops what's happening to those other five they're going home with the receiving department because it said 35 they'll say we got 35 and they'll put the other five in the trunk of their car i had an experience one time when I was a kid, when I had hair, this guy comes up in a white van. I was when I said as a kid, I was like maybe 19. This guy comes up in a white van. Me and my buddy are sitting there. I forget where we were. And he says, Hey, uh, I got some speakers. I got some speakers and I'm supposed to be delivering them. There's too many speakers. And they told me, my boss told me that if I bring the speakers back, I'm fired. So I'm just gonna, you know, sell them to you guys. And we're stupidly looking at those. And then something said, no, this is not a good idea. I mean, why would the company sit there and tell them, don't bring them back? I mean, that's ridiculous, you know, because he says, I've got 40 and it's, I'm only supposed to have 35. And they told me, don't bring back those other five or I'm fired. So years later, I'm at my parents' house in Hayward. My mom and I are standing out there sitting on the front porch. Here comes a guy driving up. Hey, lady, I got too much meat here. You want to take a look and buy some of this meat? My poor mom is like, oh, yeah, okay, you know, yeah. And I stop. Get the hell out of here. You know, and the guy asked my mom, what is he, a cop? And she said, no, no, he's an annoying auditor. And I just told her after, it had nothing to do with auditing. This is the second time I've seen this stupid scam, right? So you don't want to put the amounts on the receiving department's uh, uh, version of the copy of the purchase order. You make them count and fill it in. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look at the uh, next page and let our coming down anyway, and let's take a look at the accounts payable and recording the uh, recording the payable, but not recording the payable, which is obviously accounts payable as a record keeping step. But I want to come down and improving the invoice for payment. Okay. And so when we look at approving the invoice for payment, this is sort of an authorization slash record keeping step. I mean, it's a little kind of combined here. So when the invoice arrives, the accounting department approves it by matching the invoice, purchase order, receiving report, and the requisition. Okay. Then they take that and we call that approved voucher packet. Okay, the approved voucher packet, the invoice, purchase order, receiving report, and requisition prepared by the accounting department are received by the treasurer who prepares, signs, and mails the checks and cancels all supporting document after payment. Okay, so the um, they prepare that uh, that information in the accounting department, but then the treasurer is the one that will actually have the authority to pay, okay? And then when the payment is made, of course, the receivable is going to be reversed, okay?
Now you come over and you look at this expenditure flow chart and it's kind of like looking at something, a movie, and then they left out the, your favorite part of the movie, which the best thing here for us is whether we're talking about authorization, record keeping or custody, right? So purchasing is what? Is an authorization step. Receiving is custody, accounts payable, and again, that one, and this maybe is a little more of an art than a science, guys. I don't mean accounts receivable. I mean, it's both authorization and record keeping is going on there, right? Because they say, hey, this is a valid payment. They're comparing all these things. And then the treasurer is an authorization to pay. Okay. Now, the way they're describing this sounds like, you know, 1968. I mean, I picture people smoking cigarettes while all this is going on indoors, you know, but the um, these days, most clients would have some sort of what some sort of automated disbursement process, right? Online banking. I think we all I don't I can't remember. I rarely write a check for anything anymore. Right. OK, so what happens? If you were in an environment, uh, IT environment, remember we said sometimes you will have to do internal control testing in an iron, uh, uh, IT environment. So what you'd probably do is you would probably look and see that someone who has the ability to release electronic funds disbursements also doesn't have the authority in the, in the accounting system, in, in the uh, IT system to make entries, accounting entries those two duties should not be would be incompatible in the system and you can go to the security officer and ask them the it security officer and ask them for a listing and the rights that the individuals have they'll provide that to you and you would compare to make sure you don't have incompatible duties in the it system okay all right good um for uh the control procedures uh again where they provide them because they are very spotty look for the assertion okay and think through to yourself okay how does this procedure this control and this test of the control help me with the assertion okay good come over and let's look at our substantive procedures and they tell us that for our uh, accounts payable. The business risk that we are most concerned with is the completeness assertion, not so much the uh, existence assertion. So again, we're talking about what? We're talking about business risk, CPA business risk. Okay, but it's the mirror image of what we said for receivable. So when we look, let's start with completeness here okay and um, they always say that agree the accounts payable listing with the general ledger as though that's some sort of genius audit step if those don't agree we've got a major problem I, I, i'm not going any further i'm telling the client i don't know what the hell you're doing here your, your subsidiary ledger and your <laughs> general ledger don't match what's going on okay now uh, when you perform a search for unrecorded liabilities, okay, and let's just go ahead and let's do an example. So let's say, I don't give me a lot of room to write here in the margin for some reason, but let's say I am looking at my client's accounts payable for 2021, and I see what, I see an account payable number one, for 50,000 and I see account payable number two for 70,000. I see account payable number three over here for 80,000, I don't know, whatever, okay? And I want to see if this is complete, right? I wanna see if there is a liability that should have been recorded here that was not, I see only three. Okay, so what I could do, a classic step would be to go to the cash disbursement for the next year, 2022. 
I look at the cash disbursements in 2022, and I have cash disbursement number one for 50,000. I have cash disbursement number two for 70,000. I have cash disbursement number three for 80,000. And then I have cash disbursement number four down here for 9 million. Huh. Okay, I'm just trying to exaggerate the point here by making it 9 million. Now what happens? Notice I'm going to disbursements in the subsequent year. So I'm not starting with the financial statements. I'm starting with disbursements that were made in that next year. And I'm coming back and finding those. There's that one. Okay. And I see something that that was for that particular payable. I look at that. Okay. That looks good. Okay. That looks good. And when I pick this one down here, I look, and that's me looking for it. And I say, what happened? How come you had this $9 million disbursement? It says it was for an account payable, but it wasn't listed as outstanding at the end of the year. Oh, thanks, auditor. That was Bob. We let him go and my spidey senses are saying, uh-oh, we've got a problem, right? Okay, so that's what they're talking about right here. This whole little example is the auditor should select cash disbursements made subsequent to year end and examine the supporting documentation and look for items that should have been recorded at the balance sheet date, but were not. And that's the process that you would go through there. Okay, uh, note, um that the auditor should examine right here should examine open vouchers receiving reports vendors invoices for a period after year end looking for unrecorded liabilities and what i would suggest is you would use some sort of data analytic to sort those open purchase orders sort them by age right age them and look for some that are looking really old because why is it taking so long to receive this stuff maybe they what they uh had ordered something and received it and didn't put down the liability right and didn't report that they had received had received it and you could probably do 100 percent testing on something like that using these uh, data analytic uh, software okay okay good um come over um, and let's just take a look at the existence assertion, okay? And this gets annoying. Again, I'm getting annoyed a lot tonight, it turns out. But um, let's just take a look at what they say about where I go past it, the existence assertion right here, okay? So they say under the existence assertion, that the accounts payable confirmation is not required because external evidence exists to support the payable. And uh, however, confirmation of accounts payable may be sent when internal control is weak and when disputed amounts or when monthly statements are not available, okay? Now, they're telling us here that typically vendors with small or zero balances should be selected for confirmation. And when I looked at this, I was like, then why do we have it under the existence assertion? If we're looking for ones that are small or zero, we're not looking to see if they should be less than zero. We're looking to see if they should be more than zero. So Becker said, well, but confirmation has to be under existence. And then I started showing them a bunch of questions that indicated that we were looking for the completeness assertion when we do a confirmation of accounts payable. So they were stubborn and rather than move it under completeness, they left her under existence and then they decided to argue with themselves and say that although confirmation generally used to test existence, account payable confirmation is primarily tested completeness, then put it under freaking completeness instead of under existence. But that's OK. We won't we'll let them do that. OK, but it really is what it really is a completeness test when you send out accounts payable confirmation. And so um, when we confirm accounts payable, and we're not required to, but when we do, we will use blank positive. In other words, what do we do? We send our client's uh, vendor into their records. They, we send them a letter saying how much 
do I owe you? And you leave it blank. And when you do that, now they, if someone says, if someone comes up to you and say, hey, don't I owe you some money? You're going to go, yeah, I'm pretty, yeah, let me think about how much it is, right? So if that's the case, the vendor's probably going to do a very exhaustive search through the records because they don't want to send you back and say, no, you don't owe me anything, or they don't want to underestimate that. And then, you know, it's going to be hard to collect everything that you actually owe them, right? Okay. So you should use blank positive. Okay, and which is another indication that we're really worried about the uh, completeness assertion when we send out those confirmations. Then you come over and uh, you take a look at the auditing of the transactions. Okay, and for completeness, we should take a sample of vouchers and take them back to the purchase journal. Okay, um, for existence you're going to go the other way, test a sample of vouchers um, to confirm a proper authorization and presence in the uh, receiving report. So you go one way, you go the other way uh, for the completeness and the existence assertion. For presentation and disclosure, okay, we're looking for related party purchases, we're looking for purchase contracts, purchase commitments. We have a purchase commitment, we're going to have to take any losses if there's been a drop in the value that we're committed to purchase an item at a certain amount. And so you would look for those kinds of things. Okay. All right. We're a little past the break time, but let's go ahead and let's do this question right here. And um, this is probably my favorite CPA exam question. Okay. So, um, because it illustrates a lot right here. So let's go ahead. I'm going to give you some time to look at this one and uh, then we'll go ahead and take the break after we're done with this question. I'll give you 10 more seconds, guys. Okay, good. Uh, let's take a look at this one. And we got a good 90% getting this question uh, correct. And so um, that that's great. Um, you see the results there that almost everybody got this right. Now, when you look at this question, and let's just read through it. An auditor suspects that certain client employees are ordering merchandise for themselves over, over the internet 
without recording, without recording the purchase or the receipt. What assertion? What assertion is being screwed up here? Say completeness because stuff's not making it into the uh, uh, books. Right. Good. The completeness assertion. Okay. I'm not trying to embarrass you, Kathy, but I mean, everybody needs to be sharpening that. Okay. Okay. Good. Excellent. Without recording the purchase means it's the completeness assertion. So I know that I'm going to go from supporting documents to the accounting records. Unfortunately, they list what? supporting documents. So now I'm going to have to select the best supporting document for this, okay? So let's look at these without looking any further at the information they give us in this question at this time. What about the approved voucher packet receiving report vendors invoices? Destroyed. Well, I said without reading the rest. Ah, sorry. But you're right. They tell us that they were all destroyed. But without, if they didn't say that, how would you answer it? Those how are in-house documents. So we want Good. to put third parties. Good. The approved evidence. voucher packet is an internal document, as mm -hmm. is the receiving report is an internal document, right? The vendor's invoice is external. But the cash disbursement has also what uh, has also gone through the banking process, et cetera, and they can't get rid of that. I mean, that money got checked or whatever got cashed, and that's going to be there no matter what, right? So the best place to start would be with the cash disbursements. Good. And then, Abby, you're right. They also go ahead and they tell us, you know, sort of more of a compre reading comprehension thing when the uh, and vendor's invoice arrive, when an employee approves the invoice for payment, after the invoices are paid, the employee destroys the invoice and related vouchers, and they never recorded the receipt to begin with. So, of course, there's no receiving report. Okay, good. I like that question because it goes to the idea of reading carefully. It goes through the notion of what assertion I'm testing. It brings in the hierarchy of evidence, right? All in that one little question. So, okay. All right, good guys. Let's go ahead and let's pause there and we will come back and we'll start now. We've, we're done with the income statement. Now we're gonna start auditing the balance sheet account by account, cycle by cycle. But we'll do that in 10 minutes. So we're gonna come back at 6.50. Zoom the recording, and we're going to um, take a look now at the cash cycle. And of course, of course, if we're talking about cash now, we have transitioned from our revenue expenditures on the income statement, and we're going to start to take a look at some balance sheet accounts. Although we'll still look at payroll a little bit later, which would of course uh, be a um, income statement account. But let's go ahead and talk about fraud risk related to cash uh, cycle, and of course. Everybody loves cash, and so people are always trying to figure out how to steal cash, right? And so two fraud schemes related to uh, cash is lapping and kiting, okay? Now, with lapping, lapping occurs when an employee withholds funds received by a customer for personal use and fails to apply these receipts um, to the customer's receivable balance. So they just take the money. And a lot of times what they do is they think, okay, I'm a you know, real good poker player. And they think that they're gonna just you know, win with this money and then put back the stolen funds. Um, but as, but um, while they're kind of trying to win this money back, whatever, what happens is they um, apply subsequent receipts to the previously unrecorded amount. And again, the hope is that eventually they're gonna catch this thing up and then, of course, the whole thing collapses on them when they're not able to uh, catch up. Now, they talk about safeguards 
uh, against lapping include the following. And when they talk about safeguards, that to me is talking about internal control procedures, right? But then when you look at this, um, these sound like audit procedures to me. So the one that's really a safeguard and um, is down here, one of the best methods to guard against lapping is the use of that lockbox system. In the lockbox system, payments are sent directly to the bank, okay? So the person doesn't even have the temptation, let alone the ability to steal the money because it's going straight to the bank, right? And do this lapping trip. Now, these things that are listed here, to me, sound like good, I mean, they could be controls, but they also could be good subs, uh, substantive procedures for the auditor. For example, um, a comparison of recorded cash receipts with funds actually deposited, okay? Comparison of details in the deposit ticket with the details of remittance credits. So if we give the person a receipt, when they come in and the date of the receipt is March 10th, and then they don't get around to actually depositing that receipt supposedly until you know the end of the month or something. Why was there a delay? There should have been a daily deposit. Why did it take so long to deposit this? And when you start asking those kind of questions, that's usually where people just start saying, <laughs> I admit what I did. So uh, this is just basically to me a couple of good audit procedures. You can go ahead and flashcard that will help with lapping. Okay. Now kiting occurs when a check is drawn on one bank account and uh, is deposited in another bank, but they don't record the disbursement out of the first bank until after year end. That is kiting. In other words, what happens? That same cash is being uh, reported in both bank accounts. So they're double counting that. That's called kiting, okay? It's simultaneously reflected in two different bank accounts, okay? Now, to detect kiting, that means they're talking to you, auditor, to detect kiting effectively, a bank transfer schedule should be prepared. Now, in order to prepare a bank transfer schedule, auditor, you need to order bank cutoff statements. Okay, you have to order bank cutoff statements. So just to help us to understand what they're telling us to do here, let's go to the uh, next page, okay? And let's come down, next, next page, and let's come down to this item number four um, right here under bank reconciliation. And just let's take a look and, uh, the bank cutoff statement is obtained by the auditor from the bank and covers the first 10 to 15 days of the period after year end. So what we're doing with this bank cutoff statement is we're getting it directly from the bank and it's going to list those deposits that were in transit. And from that, we're going to be able to sit there and also list outstanding checks, but it will also list the uh, deposits that were in transit. And um, when we prepare this bank cutoff, uh, this bank transfer schedule from the cutoff statement uh, for any bank to bank transfer that occur after year end, the disbursement date on the check and the ledger, the dispersing account should precede the receipt date. You can't receive money before you disperse it. Okay. And um, so go ahead and flashcard that. What you should do with the bank cutoff statement and preparing the bank transfer schedule. And then I want you to put C, CPA. Well, it's not CPA anymore. They call it MCQ, multiple choice question. And um, it is MCQ. 0 0.5472, 0 0.5472, everybody pray 
that as I come out of tablet mode and then go back into tablet mode, please no bad things will happen. Okay, so let's just go ahead and slowly do this. One of that worked okay, I guess. Um, okay. And what I want to do is get out of full screen mode. And I want to open up my Becker software. Where are you? Okay. And I want to look for what do you say? Zero five four seven two. Okay. And go ahead and search for that. Okay. And they say in the bank transfer schedule below, they updated that because it didn't used to call it a bank transfer schedule. Now they are actually coming right out in the question and calling it that in this example, because um, that's what that is. That is the bank transfer schedule that the auditor will pre would prepare. Which of the following cash transfers results in a misstatement of cash at December uh, 31st? And they're not calling it this, but it is the misstatement is a kiting scheme. Okay. So you take a look at these and where you focus is on the per books, okay? Because the fraud would be in the books, right? And you start comparing the dates of the disbursement to the date of the receipt. And you're looking to see if you have any situation in which they received the money before it was dispersed. That means that money is being counted in both bank accounts, right? So you start looking at this and A, it was dispersed on 1231, was received on 1231. Okay, it could happen the same day. Was dispersed in X2, was received in X2. Okay, not a problem, same day. Was dispersed in 1231X1, was received 1231X1. I don't see a problem there. Was dispersed X2, but was received in X1. They counted that in both accounts, didn't they? And that's a no-no, that's kite, that's a problem. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come back. Problems, no problems. Kind of like that. What was that movie, Hurt Locker? Those guys were trying to defuse bombs and something or another. <laughs> okay. Feel like I'm one of those guys. Okay, but let's go ahead and let's take a look back and nothing bad happened. Okay, good. Thank you, God. Okay, now you come over and um, did I tell you the flashcard? Yeah, how to detect that with the bank transfer schedule. Now you come over and um, you know, and you have to get the information from the bank in the form of the bank cutoff statement, which I showed you. But another thing that you send to the bank and you send directly to the bank is a bank confirmation. And you're asking the bank to tell you, hey, how much is in this bank account? Okay, and you ask them about the interest rate because you can also use that to calculate any interest revenue. But the part of the bank um, confirmation that maybe we don't um, think about as much is in addition to verifying the year end balances, you can also ask about any loans or pledge collateral, et cetera. So in effect, you are doing a completeness test for the liability because if they have amounts on balance with this bank, then there's a chance that they also have maybe borrowed some money. And you send this uh, confirmation even if the account balance is zero, guys, because if there is an amount, if they've done, you know, you don't start randomly sending stuff out to banks, but if they've done business with the bank in the past and then all of a sudden they say the balance in that bank account is zero, send the confirmation anyway, because maybe they're saying it's zero, but there really is money in there. And then you don't send the confirmation next year. I promise you there won't be anybody in there because someone will steal it out of there at that point. Okay. 
Okay, good. Now we talked about the cutoff statement. Okay, but let's go back and look at that a little more carefully now. And we're looking at it in the contents of the bank reconciliation. And you order that cutoff statement and they say it'll include reconciling items and they should clear 10 to 15 days after. When we talk about reconciling items, we're talking about what? We're talking about items that were on the bank reconciliation listed as what? Listed as outstanding checks. Deposits in transit. Those things are listed on the bank reconciliation. Okay. And so you're going to be ordering that bank cutoff statement to see that they really did clear the bank in that next year. Right. Okay. And if it doesn't clear, what happened? You said you had an outstanding check. What happened? Okay. So that is an important function for that bank cutoff statement as well as preparing the transfer schedule that we uh, have already talked about. So just go ahead and flashcard that information, including what I wrote over here, what the reconciling items are, outstanding checks, deposit and transit listed on the bank rec. That's your client prepares a bank reconciliation and then you're checking to see that those things clear. Okay. Does the okay. auditor prepare the transfer schedule or does the client? Auditor obtains the cutoff statement from the bank and prepares the transfer schedule. Okay. And the transfer schedule is used to detect kiting. The auditor also orders this cutoff statement to uh, see that items that were listed as outstanding or in transit actually clear. So it's a little different from the bank transfer schedule, what you're doing there. Okay. Okay, okay good. Now we talk about our assertions and for the um, completeness search assertion, we're going to take a sample of remittance advices to the cash receipts journal, right? If you're saying you receive cash, should have been recorded in the, um, should have been recorded in the cash receipts journal, right? Uh, for disbursements, the auditor should look at some checks and take those to the cash disbursement. So we're starting with the supporting documents and we're taking them back to the accounting records of cash receipts, cash disbursements journal, flashcard that. For the existence assertion, now we're going to start with the accounting records. So we will um, look for the uh, for the cash receipts, and we will look at um, daily deposits, remittance advices, and entries in the deposit slip, and agree that to. Oh, I was wondering why that wasn't making any sense to me. <laughs> I'm looking at the wrong assertion, guys. Right here, for cash receipts, the auditor should vouch a sample of entries in the cash receipts journal to remittance advices deposit slip. So we're going the other way now, right? And then for cash disbursements, the auditor should vouch a sample of entries from the cash disbursements journal to the canceled checks. Are you getting a sense of this directional testing now? How we're going to the document, from the documents to the records for completeness, from the records to the documents for existence. Okay, okay, good. And then uh, for our presentation and disclosure, you know, and they keep talking about presentation disclosure and, you know, policies defining cash and cash equivalents, restrictions on cash, including sinking fund requirements. You know, I don't think the examiners will get too caught up in asking you about disclosure requirements on the auditing exam that the auditor would be looking for, because the reality is when you're doing an audit, you're going to have a disclosure checklist. Some you know, nerd in the firm is going to sit there and come up with all the things that need to be disclosed. And you're going to sit there and you're just going to you know, check off to see that they've made all those disclosures. But uh, just be aware if you see a question on, in your homework that talks about presentation disclosure and footnote requirements that you're making sure you're comfortable if you get a question on the exam as to how you would audit that. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at this question. I think this is a pretty, pretty good question.
Okay, guys, let's go ahead and look at this one. Most of us have had a chance to uh, try it. And this is this is kind of a tough question, okay? Um, the answer here is A. I'm not sure this is the uh, best worded question. So a good 70% of us got this kind of tough question right. So uh, that's good, okay? But um, let's take a look. That's a good outcome. But let's just take a look at this one. And they're asking us about the bank cutoff statement. And they're saying that the auditor would most likely look at and let's start from the bottom. Uh, deposits, let's start with D. Deposits recorded in cash receipts journal after year end to the cutoff statement. Well, that's next year's issue. You know, I don't know what, why we'd be worried about disbursements made after the financial statement date. That's not affecting our financial statements at all. So that would be something the auditor would do if they were bored, I guess. Then you look at what you look at C. Checks dated after year end listed on the cut cutoff statement to the year end outstanding um, checklist. Well, checks dated after year end would not be listed as an outstanding check. Those are checks that were dated before year end that haven't cleared the bank yet, right? That are part of my outstanding checks on my reconciliation. So I'm not going to do that. B, deposit in transit listed in the cutoff statement to the year-end bank reconciliation. Now, B is tempting, and I really don't think this is a fair thing for them to put. I guess what they're saying here is that a deposit, it's not listed as a deposit in transit. It's simply listed as what? It's simply listed as a deposit that cleared the bank after year end, right? So I guess that's why that's not correct, okay? So then you, if you were sitting there and debating between A and B, now it becomes a wording thing. A is worded much better. Prior year checks listed in the cutoff statement because they would be listed as prior year checks because we would see the dates on them, wouldn't we? Prior year checks listed in the cutoff statement to the year end outstanding checklist on the bank reconciliation. Yeah, that's the best answer. This is an evil question because they put that up there in A. So by the time you're down to D, you know, you're, you're a little beat up here, okay? So, so when you get a question like that, take a deep breath and go back through each one of them carefully and you start to build up a little scar tissue with this. So this is one that might take you a little longer on your exam and that's okay. I don't think you're going to have a time crunch on your auditing exam like you might have experienced with, uh, you know, say FAR or BC or regulation. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at our next cycle. Notice guys, we're just sort of marching our way through the balance sheet now, okay, we looked at our cash, we, well, we looked at our receivables in connection with our sales. Uh, now we're going to come over to inventory and, um, you know, I'm going to quickly go through the separation of authorization, record keeping and custody here, because this is the mirror image of what we talked about for our uh, expenditure cycle and our accounts payable, right? Okay, so purchasing is going to be an authorization receiving is what is a custody right okay the warehouse is custody a lot of custody because we're talking about physical items right and then our shipping is going to be custody okay we're talking about inventory so it shouldn't be surprising that there's an awful lot of custody there okay now we come over and um, we take a look at the auditing, the inventory balance. And let's just look at this and uh, flashcard this. The observation of beginning and ending physical inventory counts is a required generally accepted auditing procedure. And it involves the following, okay? Now, uh, I was on an assignment one time where they wanted us to, uh, where I helped with the audit of the Senate restaurant. And they put me on that because in those days you had to do certain procedures in order to get your license. And there weren't a whole lot of opportunities to audit inventory in the federal government, but because the Senate had its own restaurant and the GAO audited that at that time, they said, hey, um, did I resume the recording? Yeah. 
they said, hey, um, you know, John, why don't you help out with that to fly you back to Washington and spend a week there helping him with the center restaurant. So I went and I did that work. And um, when you get in there, they hand you a parka and you start going to these freezers to count the inventory. And what the inventory taking personnel were doing is they were reading things off of the list and then finding them in the freezers. That is not how you take inventory. You take inventory by what? By counting the items that are actually in there and then recording that on the inventory taking sheets, right? So that you're counting everything. If you sit there and you just go from the sheet to find the things, you're gonna mess up what? The completeness assertion, aren't you? Because there might be something in there that wasn't on the list, okay? So I, we went back and I reported, hey, uh, I saw some problems. They were doing it this way. They sent out a memo for, because the actual count, that was a pre-count, the actual count was gonna be the next day. And they sent out a memo saying, GAO observed that there was some problem, inventory should be taken floor to ceiling, wall to wall, right? Then when you go and you take the real inventory count, then you come back and you're observing to see if they're following the correct procedures, okay? So I tell that story just so that you can kind of get a context is what they're talking about that the auditor is looking for. We're evaluating management's instructions, observing the performance of the counts, inspecting inventory to ascertain existence and condition, and then you're going to perform some test counts. So you don't count every single thing. You're more just watching them. But then you will perform a certain amount of test counts to verify what they're said are the counts. So if they say there's 23 you know, pork butts in the uh, freezer, you'll go back and you'll count the pork butts to see that you agree with that inventory count. So you don't count everything, but you do do uh, some test counts, okay? Now, if you are not there to observe that, you're going to have to perform an alternative procedure, okay? Unless it's impractical to do so, or if, uh, you know, uh, the inventory is not material, you won't even audit it. They always keep saying that. If something's not material, you're not going to audit it. I'm not going to do any work over anything that's not material. Just won't audit it if it's not material. Okay, now uh, take a look. And it says, if the company maintains well-kept perpetual system and performs a physical inventory count throughout the year, then the auditor could observe that inventory account uh, before or after year end. Um, if the inventory count is done at a date other than the financial statements, we need to roll forward and obtain evidence about the date that uh, we saw the inventory count and the end of the year. If we have risk of material misstatement is high, again, they keep, they should be careful and say risk of material misstatement. Anyway, the risk of material misstatement is high, then of course we're gonna do year end testing and you need to be careful about inventory that may be held off site. If their inventory is held off site, then you're gonna to have to get some assurance that those items are actually there. You will have to get some sort of a, um, you know, a letter from the custodian of that inventory confirmation, or uh, maybe you send someone from one of your other offices to look at it. The other thing that they don't mention here is if the inventory is held at two different locations, you need to have those counts done on the same day. In other words, if you have a situation where the client has a warehouse in San Francisco and a warehouse in San Jose, let's say, those you have to have enough staff so that those counts can be done on the same day. Because if you don't, that sound you hear are trucks going down 101, from San Francisco to San Jose, you're gonna count the same inventory items twice, right? So it has to happen all on the same day. Now they make this pass key point here uh, that is important, um, but I think my story already helped you with that. The auditor does not count the inventory, the client counts the inventory, the auditor observes that process to see if they're satisfied with it. And then they do do some test counts. Now, when you look at this list here, um, the company will have pre-numbered inventory tags. So there'll be all these different inventory items and the auditor will find the tag that says there's a hundred of these 
And if we're talking about completeness, you'll go from that tag back to the inventory report. You'll also select some things from the inventory report and go back to the pre-numbered tags to see that that all agrees for existence. In addition, the auditor will do some test counts. And with the test counts, you'll do what? You'll take these test counts back to the inventory report. And then you will pick some of the um, items from the inventory um, listing the financial statements, right? They will roll up into the financial statements and then you'll go and see that those uh, show up on your test counts. Okay. Okay, good. You come over and uh, basically what they just showed us on the graph, there is what uh, they're saying down here, but let's just go ahead and flashcard it here. Uh, test um, we go to the test count to the report, verifying the completeness. And then the auditor should also select a sample pre number of inventory tags and take those back to the inventory test counts. Guys, um, I, uh, or take those back to the inventory report sheets, I should say. Uh, I, I ignore the word trace and vouch a lot because the exam is not consistent in using those words for the completeness and the existence assertion. So be careful with that. Don't get hypnotized into thinking that you just have to memorize trace for completeness vouch for existence because the exam doesn't adhere to that. Okay, so um, just flashcard that. Then if we're talking about existence, as we saw in the graphic up there, we're going to do what? We're going to uh, find the items in the report, and then we're going to take them back to the physical inventory. And we'll do that both for test counts and for the inventory tags. You can just flashcard that. I don't think they mentioned test counts there, but they should have. Okay, rights and obligations. If there is some sort of, um, you know, consignment inventory on hand, it is excluded. At the same time, what if we have stuff out on consignment, it needs, if it's consigned inventory on hand, it needs to be excluded. If we have things that are another company's pre premises that are out on consignment, then those have to be included, right? We can flashcard that. Rights and obligations, again, I don't think they get too much up into presentation and disclosure, but rights and obligations for inventory, reviewing loan agreements and minutes or evidence that the inventory has been pledged or assigned as collateral or whatever, that would probably be a good presentation issue that uh, you want to be concerned about. Okay, all right, good. With that, let's go ahead and let's take a look at the question. What assertion, guys? To gain, uh, let me, I'll put up the poll. I'll put the poll up in a second. To gain, let's do this one together. To gain assurance that all inventory items in a client's inventory listing are valid. What assertion? All things listed are valid. What assertion? Resistance? Good. Excellent. Okay, good. We're sharpening that. It's existence, isn't it? Right? And then look what they do. An auditor would most likely trace, but I thought it was vouch for existence. They're asking me about existence and they use the word trace, didn't they? Okay, so don't just memorize trace for existence. If you know what you're doing. If we're looking to see that something's valid, it's the existence assertion. And so Inventory tags noted to the items? No, that's completeness. You start with the inventory tags and you take them. Well, I don't even know what that is. Inventory tags listed. Yeah, inventory tags, that's tags is what? Is the physical items and taking them back to the inventory listing. That's completeness, isn't it? Okay. Inventory tags. Don't get frustrated. Don't get frustrated. Get strong. Don't get mad, get even with these questions. Hey, I'm telling you, this is how you have to look at them. You start giving up on this, that sound you hear is not passing the exam. Okay, B, inventory tags noted during the auditor, auditor's observation to items listed in receiving reports. That's again, maybe a completeness test. 
C, items listed in the inventory listing to the inventory tags. Yeah, that's existence. This is how you have to approach these questions, guys. This is the skill you have to, you know, strengthen up in order this process. I don't know what you call it, skill or, yeah, I guess it's a skill that you want to sharpen up to be successful on the exam. Okay. And the more you do this, the better you get at this, the faster you go through these questions and you are not going to have a time crunch on the audit exam is my, is my prediction. Okay, good. Let's look at the investment cycle. Investment cycle, guys, is light. Okay, it's a light cycle. So let's just go ahead though and take a look at a couple of things. We have, again, authorization, custody, record keeping. Okay, authorization, high level. Board of directors should really be authorizing the purchase and sale of investments. Custody, an independent third party custodian is recommended, um, but uh, custody should take the form of joint control of two officials. If it's not an independent third party, safe deposit box. Um, if held by the company, investments should be periodically counted. And here we go, we're kind of talking about 1968 again. I mean, these days, most you know, investments that you would make exist in book entry form. I mean, there is no security anymore. It's just a, an entry on a computer somewhere that says so-and-so owns so many shares of this stock. And you, as far as the company that issued the stock, they don't know you, they know, the underwriter that took that stock down and then you buying it from Schwab or something like that. So um, these all exist in book entry. Now, the one exception that I've heard about is if your client has investments in foreign entities, often those foreign entities do still hold physical, uh, issue physical you know, pieces of paper for their investment securities um, and so, uh, you know, that could be the case, but for the most part, they're book entry form, but, you know, the exam often just ask about very, you know, kind of old fashioned things that they like to ask about. Okay. So internal control should also exist re uh, regarding the processing and fair value, uh, measurement control surrounding fair value estimates, whether inside the company or outside should a uh, third party be used to address fair value also must be understood. And then they don't do a very good job telling me, well, what the hell am I supposed to understand? So what you want to write here is a fair value determination should be separated from authority to make investments. Flashcard that, that's what they really are trying to say you need to understand. So flashcard that fair value determination should be separated from authority to make investments. Think about it. I say, oh, oh, yeah, we need to buy this stock. This is a good investment for me. And then you come to me and say, hey, John, determine the fair value of this. Well, look, <laughs> it's in my interest. So, oh, it's going through the roof. Look at this, right? Meanwhile, maybe the top stock is, you know, should be deep, should be, you know, written down. So you want there, you as an auditor, we want that kind of a separation uh, for the company. Okay. Now you come over and um, they start to look at. Uh, completeness. And they say that we should look at transactions a few days after year end. And it's like, well, what transactions after year end? And the transaction that they're talking about here is, well, I should probably put the word large cash disbursement. Okay, maybe there was some sort of uh, ability to have a delay in actually settling up and paying for security that was purchased before year end. So you'd be looking for a large cash disbursement after year end 
to see if there was should have been uh, also a discussion of some sort of uh, you know investment coming in. Got a question um, about uh, cutoff on that. You know, usually if someone authorizes like places an order to purchase a security, there might be a two or three day clearing period. And if that's done close to year end, um, is the date the purchase was recorded or the day the trade clears considered the date that um, it should be on the books? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, I would think though my, my sense is, and I think I asked, I wrote this here about looking for large cash disbursement. My sense is that you can commit, you could be committed to purchase an investment, but not have to pony up the cash until sometime after that, right? And so if that's the case, then that would be listed as an investment at the balance sheet date. Okay. Even though the actual payment doesn't come until later, right? So there should be an investment and a liability that gets reported at year end um, in that sort of a scenario. Okay. Okay. Um, coming over, uh, and, and Kathy notice they're talking about, um, searching for unrecorded purchases. So again, you know, if they're dispersing that after your end, that to me, that's when that would show up. That's why you'd be looking after your end. If it happens in the year, then you're going to see this disbursement near your end and you're going to be, well, what was this for? And it's, it's not going to help them if they don't put it for an investment of some sort. So um, I want to look at right here, test of details related to the investment cycle, focus on year end balances, okay, and presentation and disclosure. Um, so go ahead and flashcard that, um, in other words, we take an approach of ending balance because there shouldn't be a whole lot of transactions to look at. Um, and then analytical procedures are used to test the reasonableness of related gains and uh, investment income. And you can just go ahead and put recalculate. By auditing related accounts. Okay, and go ahead and flashcard that. Recalculate by auditing, that says auditing related accounts. Recalculate by auditing related accounts. And then you can just put EG um, um, bond investment and interest revenue. Okay, interest revenue. So if you're sitting there and you have a bond that you're satisfied that they actually hold that bond investment, and they're reporting some sort of interest income off of that, which would include any amortization of discounts and premiums and whatnot, you would sit there and recalculate that and see if that agrees to what they're reporting as the interest revenue, right? So you just recalculate. That's the best way to audit that kind of thing. Okay, good. Come over and let's take a look at uh, the valuation assertion, which as you might imagine is pretty important for investments. And they say, Obtain evidence corroborating quoted year end fair values. Well, you mean look at Yahoo Investments? Look at the Wall Street Journal? Yeah. You look and you pick up the Wall Street Journal or whatever it is, the Yahoo Investments. You look up that stock that's quoted, that has a quoted year end fair value, and you sit there and multiply that by the number of shares they say they hold. You know, it's published, right? And uh, that's a good way to audit the uh, valuation assertion, okay? Now, if, um, you know, the stock is not published, then you may need to get an independent broker, third party, and put down here, not the person 
that sold client the stock. Don't go to the same person they bought it from and say, oh, what's the value of this? Okay, it's got to be an independent uh, third person. And that's in the case where the stock is not, um, is not being, um, you know, uh, pub the, 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 you know, it's not a publicly traded stock or whatever. Um, recalculate values of investments not reported at fair value. And for example, if we're using the equity method, then the amount that we're showing is that investment is going to be based on the uh, financial performance of the subsidiary. And so the best thing to do is ask for audited financial statements of the subsidiary. Then you can sit there and you can look at, well, their net income was 100,000. My client holds 30% of that stock. They have to use the uh, equity method. So they should be showing investment income of 30,000, right? And the evidence that you'd use for the net income would be the audited income statement of the, uh, of the investee, of the subsidiary. Well, I guess I shouldn't call them the subsidiary because then that would constitute probably a consolidation. So uh, we would say of investee. That says investee. Investee is a better word there than the uh, fiduciary, uh, subsidiary. But uh, make sure and flashcard that. Okay, come over and uh, let's take a look at the existence assertion. Okay, existence confirmation. That's the classic. You just confirm with somebody that is holding that security. You just confirm, hey, do you hold so many shares? of XYZ stock on behalf of this client and they send that confirmation back to you. If there are securities on hand, then um, you should go ahead and you know make an examination of those. And um, the auditor, it says, should record the details of security count on a worksheet and have the client acknowledge that that was returned back to them intact again. I mean, these days, securities are in book entry form. So this is kind of, again, describing something that might have happened in 1967. But I still do see some questions that contemplate this. And maybe they're thinking about the potential, well, if you have securities of a foreign company, uh, that may actually be a physical security. Okay, Come over, and um, there is an ex uh, expectation that interest earned on investment and debt security will agree to the effective interest rate that security is purchased. So perform analytical procedure to obtain evidence that the interest earned does not materially different, differ from that expectation. In other words, as I was saying earlier, once you're satisfied that they really do hold this bond investment, then you should be able to leverage off of that, to pivot off of that, to be able to um, recalculate the interest revenue. And we kind of had said that earlier auditing related accounts okay come over um auditing investment transactions valuation and um, you can make independent calculations should be made to determine the validity of recorded gains and losses from the sales security and premium and discount amortization okay again talking about the recalculation of uh some of these things and then they come down and um, recalculation is what they're talking about here. But then investment income from dividends, and I don't know that you necessarily have to recalculate it, but uh, different investment services, uh, they call out Moody's here, will um, uh, publish information on what was the dividend per share that was paid. And if you're using you know, the cost or equity method, your client is using those methods, you can use that dividend record and sit there and say, well, it was uh, you know, $10 per share dividend and my client holds a thousand shares. So this should be the dividend income that's reported under the cost method or a fair value through net income method. 
or if they're using um, the equity method, that would be a reduction in the investment account, but you can do a recalculation of all those things. And then understandability and classification. And for example, if we're dealing with uh, available for sale securities, then um, you know, that would be reported as other comprehensive income versus a trading security is going to have to go into um, our um, net income. Okay, good. Let's come over to the income statement. And uh, they go on a bit about investments, don't they? I mean, this is a pretty light area. They're kind of going nuts here, but let's just keep looking over here at um, investment and security when valuation are based on financial results. And I've already had you flashcard this. You can flashcard it here, obtain and read the financial statements of an audit report of the investee. And if the financial statements are not audited, ask the client to have the investee get those statements audited. Then you can use that information to make your calculations regarding, um, you know, any, um, um, you know, amounts that you're going to put in using the equity method. Uh, level one inputs means that there are um, means that there are quoted market prices. Level two means that there are similar or identical assets uh, if the stock is not uh, traded. And then you could have level three unobservable inputs and would be determined on management's judgment. And it's probably here for these level three that you're probably getting that third party um, independent opinion on the value of some of these stocks that aren't listed. Okay. Management is responsible, of course, for making sure that the financial statements uh, are adhering to gap in the area of fair value. Auditor responsibility coming down to discussion of fair value is to understand the entity's process for determining fair value, test fair value measurement and disclosure, and we're going to get into that a little bit later, and then obtain representation from management. You're going to get the management rep letter, and you're going to ask them to sign off that the securities that they are carrying is held in maturity securities, that they do have the positive intent and ability to hold those to maturity. I mean, there's no other way to audit that other than having management sign off that that is their intent. And that's the kind of thing that goes into the representation letter that we'll talk about in a later uh, chapter. Now, in performing the test and just continue these flashcards, these actual tests, okay, and uh, if, Things are quoted, verify the quoted market prices, develop an independent estimate. So you always understand management's process and then you develop an independent fair value estimate for cooperative purposes. And you may need to consider the use of a specialist. So flashcard these procedures, okay? But it's basically, when we're talking about estimates, it seems like it's always the same thing. And fair value is just another estimate. Anytime you're auditing estimate, what do you do? You understand management's process for coming up with those estimates and you recalculate. I mean, that's the primary thing that you do. What did they do? You look at that, see if that's reasonable, and then you recalculate. Okay. All right, good. Let's look at this question. So I went on quite a bit for a light. What I'm is it going to be a light area on the exam? They they give us a lot of information. So let's let's try out this question.
Okay, guys, let's look at this one. I gave you a little bit more time because this trick question can be a little bit tricky, but it looks like we did pretty good. We got about 70% on the uh, right answer, and we got a couple of folks picking A. Um, and I think sometimes when I see um, A being picked in a question like this, I'm thinking, uh oh, I think maybe. Um, you know, somebody missed the word least here, okay? And if you miss that, you're going to read that first one and say, oh, yeah, that's a good procedure. Meanwhile, saying, what would you least likely do? Um, so the way to guard against missing that word least is, of course, read the question carefully up front, but also read carefully through all the choices. Because when you do, then all of a sudden you'll be like, well, wait a minute, there's two right answers here. And then you look back and you say, oh, it's at least likely, okay? So which of the following would an auditor least likely consider respect to fair value? And A is looking for segregation of duty between those committing the entity to certain transactions and those responsible for undertaking the valuations. Yeah, we want that to be separated. We don't want the guy whose whole job is, you know, to give us good investments to also say, oh yeah, this is the fair value. They're gonna be tempted to inflate that, right? So it looks like they're getting these great investments, okay? B, the effect of fair value measurement and disclosure of information available subsequent to the audit. Well, how, how far subsequent to the audit would we be doing this? You know, I do sometimes, have audit flashbacks where I'll be sitting there 20 years later going, why didn't I ask the agency to give me this information? That does happen, you know, post-traumatic stress or something. I don't know. But there's times where I'll be sitting there out with friends and I'll go, you know, I should have had those people give. Well, how long ago was that, John? 20 years ago. Let it go. Okay. So no, you're not going to sit there and, you know, look at things after the audit, subsequent to the audit. When the audit's over, it's over. You don't sit there and keep looking. Oh, I wonder what happened to those investments. No. I mean, maybe you might have a morbid curiosity about it or something, but it's not something you're likely to do. Okay. The role of information technology. Absolutely. Are you kidding? These days, with all the different analytics and whatnot, you can perform to help you to determine what the fair value is. And now you're going to ignore these? No, you would definitely do that. Whether the valuation method used are appropriate in relation to the industry, sure. That's a nice analytical procedure. Okay. Question. Okay, guys, I'm going to stop there because I don't, number one, I think we've reached a saturation point again in terms of your mind's ability to hold everything. And I don't like starting a module and not being able to finish it, which we cannot finish this module. We still have uh, property, plant, and equipment, which is easy and light, uh, medium, I guess. We have payroll, and we'll have the financing cycle before we get into some other uh, areas. So we'll knock this stuff out next time and hopefully have some time uh, to start to uh, encroach into chapter five um, and uh, kind of get ourselves closer to uh, back on track because I do think we're a little bit behind. But I, I don't want to. I don't want to push this at this point. Question. All right, guys, you got a new set of stuff to be going through. Your reward for getting one chapter done is another chapter. So keep going, okay? And uh, we will see you next week. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Have a good night, guys. You too.